Hey guys, so two recent articles came out about Ancestors of the Humankind Odyssey, so let's take a look at them both. The first is interviewing Patrice Desolet on the game and the creation of Panache Digital Games from Gaming Industry by Christopher Dring. The link is down below. The article goes over several issues and stories about the game's development and is mainly concerned with the ideas of the game's creation. So let's take a look at them one at a time. And before we dig in, if you like history and video games, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and feel free to follow me on Twitter and Discord to chat things up. And if you want to help the channel even more, please consider going on my Patreon account and supporting the channel there as well. Thank you. According to the article, it has been about 10 years since Patrice had released a game, and it had taken about 4 years to develop Ancestors. Him and his buddy, Jean-Francois Boivin, I don't know how to pronounce it, and apparently the article knows this, just referring to him as JF. Either way, they went to over 45 developers only to be turned down. Finally, he decided at the Montreal International Game Summit, or MIGS, to create and place an email with the name of his would-be studio instead of his personal email. And hopefully all the info was password protected. Ha ha. The studio was Panache Digital Games. Journalists got the word out, and a few friends decided to invest, and his idea grew larger. Large enough that Private Division, under Take-Two Interactive, took notice and made an offer. Four years later, we are seeing Patrice's vision come to reality. The main idea for creating this game came from two areas. One was how Patrice is just known as the history game guy in the gaming world, and so was not allowed to have an independent thought of his own. Just kidding. But he felt he had to keep it up since it was his thing. The second was that he felt humans today are so detached from the natural world. The game would try to help us realize in the present the past we once came from and try to connect with it again. He even goes so far as to say that he feels humans are mutants, minus the superpowers and skin type body wear. Now, if that's a driving force for the game, would that mean we will see some sort of influence on the game environment? We know we can eat ourselves out of a place, forcing us to move, but would there be environments that perhaps suffer or change because of our presence? Say, for example, if we kill a major predator in the area. We think we've done well, but now we have way more predators eating up our potential food sources. Or, say if we start eating food and stealing eggs, tearing up plants for roots and tools, and we start forcing other creatures to suffer. Our clan may be small, at least at first, but I have a feeling players will exploit a natural instinct we have. Greed. I call it the just-in-case syndrome. Gamers do it all the time, whether it be health potions, credits, or other items, we tend to start hoarding everything because we potentially don't want to be caught without it. What's more, we don't ever know how much we're going to need, so we always collect more, whatever the item is, just in case. We will almost surely, or at least inadvertently, do this in the game. Before release for most games, content is flooded with gameplay vids, commercials, and the like and constantly talking about the different aspects of the game to entice people to buy it. But with Ancestors, we've been hearing the same information for the most part, with vague little tidbits given out once in a while. That's why I'm breaking out my anthropology cap to try to figure out what the game will have in store for us. Patrice and the other staff have been repeating the same info for almost every interview for months without adding too much new content to it. Everything is organic, not buildings. You lead your clan around and evolve. So why is this? I've mentioned it before in other videos, but Patrice confirmed it in the article. He resists telling journalists about how many predators there are, for example, because part of the game is finding things out. Of course there is not an infinite number, but the exact number is not going to be told to us because he wants us to discover it. He describes it as taking away the magic from the game, or the exploration. He wants us to really connect with these apes, so we will know what they know, and find out what they find out when they find out. These apes didn't have internet or research to tell them about all the large cats or eagles that were around them, for example. They usually found out if they saw one or if a clan member got eaten by one. They didn't automatically know which plants were edible or not. They found out by one of them test eating it and see if they got sick or if it even tasted good. So the same for us. We are not going to be preloaded with information. The developers don't want that. They want us to find out as we play. Unless, of course, you uh, watch my videos where I'm basically taking educated guesses at the thing. Like and subscribe now, it's free and I hear it makes you beautiful. So I would like to ask you, the viewer, does knowing too much about a game kill the allure of it? Or when should we be content that we know enough and not need to hear or see anymore? 
<laughs> actual gameplay videos and not pre-rendered trailers. <laughs> Lastly, in this article, Patrice wants to shine a light on the Panache team. There are just over 30 people, he has a picture of all of them up in the office, and while he knows his name is always mentioned with the game, he wants to make it clear that it's the team's creation. The second article is 14 cool things we need to know about the game by Shunhankar Parijat? I don't know, I'm sorry. There's also a YouTube vid. The sections are short and rather vague, but it warrants a look -see. Some of the items I have already discussed on this channel, so I will only focus on the ones that are adding some new information. Now everything is still rather vague, it talks about evolution, environmental hazards, and how you'll be playing a clan, and so on and so forth. One thing of note is the section on injuries. As we will be climbing a lot, we will have the risk of missing a branch and falling to our death or at least injury. And while we knew this, climbing will not be as automatic as, say, Assassin's Creed or such. Oh, and Patrice hates that the game keeps on getting inadvertently compared to Assassin's Creed. A studio of a few thousand people versus a studio of 30 plus people is not a contest. We know Patrice, but come on, it's been about a decade since you've released a game, people are going to naturally compare. In other way, the article states that injury will have a lasting impact. So perhaps a clan member may have a limp walk, or perhaps even a missing limb. Fear is next. Being chased by an animal or exploring a totally new environment can take us into what's called the fear zone, where our vision gets hazy like we've been knocking back too many fermented grapes. If we don't get to the safe zone quickly, we will go into hysteria, which everyone up to this point says is bad, but has in no way told, shown, or hinted what bad means. Is there a way to come back from it? Once it happens, do we just write that ape off and just switch to another clan member? What? Other than the hazy view and fear mode, I've seen nothing really that's hampering us. So I'm curious to find out what hysteria means in the game. The article moves on to skills, which is of course a skill tree designed as brain cells and nerves. The more you explore, the more you develop. But one thing is that if an ape dies, all the progress and knowledge that they learned will automatically be transferred to the next ape you control. So we can assume if you learn something with one ape, it automatically is learned by the rest of the clan. I would have liked at least some little mini thing where I had to teach troop members the new skill I just found out. I don't know. For exploring, the only thing of note is that it mentions something about unlocking new areas and when we do, we can start a new game in that area. It's explained more in the next item, which is game modes. There will be three of them. The basic is just the beginner level with giving us tutorials on how to do everything before we forget it two seconds later while being chased by a hyena. The next mode is survival. According to the article, you must survive all by yourself, so perhaps no clan to start with. Or at all. The third is custom, allowing you to choose the area to start in, if you unlocked it, and choose how many clan members you want to have. If you notice, there is nothing mentioned like, on basic mode you get a second chance if your ape gets eaten or something. This game is going to be deadly at any mode. Just it's offering you the chance to get eaten alone or letting your mates watch, with or without advice telling you not to be eaten on the side. For game length, we are looking at around 40 to 50 hours long in total, but it may be drastically longer since there are preset missions for the most part and we're going to be fumbling around the wilderness for a bit trying to figure out which button allows us to throw a rock rather than our own poo. And that's it for the articles. At least for the new things mentioned anyway. As always, let me know what you think about the game, its modes, the limited information given out, and other aspects we talked about today. And if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button and subscribe for more historical content in games. And thank you for watching, to all my sub wonderful subscribers, and to those of you here for the first time. I'm Eric, the Lone Pine Wolfman, and remember gamers, never stop learning.